Hi everybody. So we've been learning a little bit about how to take derivatives of different types of functions using different techniques. And today we're going to start talking about taking derivatives of inverse functions. So up until now we've been focused on looking at functions where the y is not by itself. In these problems we're going to be looking at functions where we are trying to take the derivative of the inverse function of a function that we know. So we're going to start by doing a, a little bit of a review of what exactly inverse functions are. An inverse function is a function whose equation undoes another equation. For example, if your original function is f of x equals 2x, then the inverse of that would be f, of, f inverse of x equals 1 half x. Because if your first function takes the inputs and multiplies by 2, then your second function, the inverse, should undo that. So to undo multiplying by 2, we would either think about that as dividing by 2 or multiplying by 1 half. So another way to write this would be x divided by 2. What you're noticing here is that they are undoing each other. So this guy says multiply by 2, this guy says divide. They're undoing. We're also going to look at inverse functions in three different ways. So we're going to look at how the equations of inverse functions are related to each other, how tables of values of inverse functions are related to each other, and how graphs of inverse functions are related to each other. So let's start with equations. To find the equation of an inverse function, first you switch the x and the y, and then you re-solve for y. So an example of a problem that we would do that would be if f of x equals this guy, find the inverse. So step one would be switch the x and the y. So instead of f of x, I would write y, I'm sorry, I would write x because f of x usually means y. So I would write x equals 3 y cubed minus 5. So you'll notice that I switched the x and the y. And now I'm going to do some algebra to actually get y by itself. So in order to get this y by itself, I would add 5 on both sides and I would have x plus 5 equals 3y cubed. Then I would divide everything by 3 and so I would have y cubed equals x plus 5 all over 3 and then I would do the cube root on both sides to get the y by itself. And that would be my inverse function. Now one note that we need to remember is that sometimes it is impossible to find the actual equation of the inverse function using algebra. So sometimes it's going to be impossible for us to actually compute this equation, which means we're going to need to have a technique for getting the derivative without actually computing the inverse function. And that's what we're going to be focused on today. So just like for implicit differentiation, we were getting the derivative without getting y by itself. Today we're going to be getting the derivative without actually having to find the inverse first. So let's go and continue a review of inverse functions by looking at tables. Since inverse functions undo each other, the x values of the original function become the y values of the inverse and vice versa. So for example, if this is a table for your original function, can we make a table for the inverse? Well, we can, and the reason is because the inverse just takes the x's and y's and switches them. So just like we started off solving, by switching the x's and y's, we're just going to switch the x's and y's in the table as well. So my new x would be negative 10, and the corresponding y would be negative 2. We're just switching the ordered pairs. Then I would have negative 7 and negative 1, negative 4 and 0, negative 1 and 1, and 1 and 2.
Now that we've looked at equations and tables, the last thing we're going to look at is graphs. So to make the graph of an inverse function, you could find the inverse function's equation and graph it. But sometimes it's impossible to find that equation. So option number two would be to make a table of values for the original and then switch them before you graph them. Option number three, however, which I think is the easiest one, is to reflect the graph of the original over the line y equals x. So here's what I mean. First, let's start by graphing the line y equals x. So the line y equals x starts at 0, and the slope is up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1. So the line over which we're going to reflect our graph is this one. Now if I find some nice ordered pairs on the original, the original goes through 0, 0, 1, 1, 4, 2, and 6, 7, 8, 9, 3. If I reflect those, 0, 0 stays here, 1, 1 stays here, 4, 2 becomes 2, 4, 9, 3 becomes 3, 9, which would be way up here. So the new graph would look like this. Now, why are we talking about all of this? Well, I think it's important before we learn how to find the derivative of an inverse function to review what exactly an inverse function is and to realize that there are going to be times when we can't find the equation of the inverse. So just like with implicit, let's start with an example where we can find that equation. Look for a pattern of how to solve and then use the pattern to solve problems where we can't find the equation. So in this problem, I'm going to ask you to find a bunch of different stuff. So for part A, it says find f of negative 1. So for part A, f of negative 1 just means take negative 1 and plug it into the original function instead of x. So I would have negative 1 plus 3 cubed negative 1 plus 3 is 2, cubed is 8. Now part b says find the f inverse of 8. Well I can't find f inverse of 8 before I have an equation for the inverse. So I'm going to start by finding an equation. So I would write x equals parentheses y plus 3 cubed. I'm taking the original and I'm switching the x's and the y's. I would cube root both sides to get rid of that cubed. And then I would subtract 3, so I would have the cube root of x minus 3. Which means f inverse of x would equal the cube root of x minus 3. So now if the part b says to find the inverse of 8, I would do f inverse of 8 equals the cube root of 8 minus 3. Now the cube root of 8 is 2, minus 3 would be negative 1. One thing I want you to notice was that when we plugged negative 1 into the original we got 8, and when we plugged 8 into the inverse we got negative 1, which should make sense because the x and y values should be switched. Now part C here, so this was part B, was in red. Part C here says find the derivative of the original problem at negative 1. So let's first start by finding the derivative. The derivative would be 3 parentheses x plus 3 squared. And then chain rule would just be times 1 because the derivative of x is just 1. So now if I plug in the number negative 1, I get 3 times negative 1 plus 3 squared. Now negative 1 plus 3 is 2, squared is 4, times 3 is 12. So my derivative at negative 1 is 12. And then the last thing says find the derivative of the inverse at 8. So to find the derivative of the inverse, I would start by doing the derivative of the inverse's equation. This is really x to the one-third. So to take the derivative, I would have one-third 
x to the negative two-thirds, and the derivative of negative three is just zero. So this would simplify to one over three times the cube root of x squared. And now if I want to take the inverse's derivative and plug in eight, I would have one over three times the cube root of eight squared. Now eight squared is 64, the cube root is four times three is 12, so I would get one over 12. Now this is all fine, but in order to do this, we had to actually find the inverse function before we could plug in any numbers. But maybe we can use this that we just did and look for a connection between the derivative of the original and the derivative of the inverse. What do you notice about the derivative of the original at negative one and the derivative of the inverse at eight? Well, what I notice is that the derivative of the original and the derivative of the inverse are reciprocals of each other. To get this guy, I would just put one over this, just flip it over. So the derivative of the inverse is one over the derivative of the original. But the numbers we plugged in were different. In the original, we plugged in the number one to get that derivative, and in the inverse, we plugged in the number eight to get that derivative. And the reason is because the input of the inverse is a y value of the original, and the input of the derivative is an x value of the original. So remember how when we plugged in negative one, we got eight, and when we plugged in eight, we got negative one? Those numbers are like partners. They partner up together. Those x's and y's go together. So the eight being here meant the negative one would be plugged in here. Now how will we use this to find a shortcut? So we can use this by taking, by making a shortcut so that we don't have to find the uh, derivative, the actual inverse function in order to get the derivative. So to make a shortcut for finding the derivative, we need to do this for several reasons. Number one, it's easier and faster. If you know the shortcut, it's going to save you some time and some brain power. But number two, it is not always possible to actually find the equation of an inverse function using algebra. So sometimes this is the only way to get the derivative is by using this shortcut method. So if the problem says let f of x equal x to the fifth plus x plus one find the derivative of the inverse at one. So this means the derivative of the inverse. We're going to do this with a four-step process. Number one, take the derivative of the original. Number two, write one over the derivative of the original. So do the reciprocal, because we saw that these answers were the reciprocals of each other. Then calculate the x value that corresponds to the given y. The reason we need to do this is since this is a derivative, this is actually a y value of the original. So we're going to need to calculate the x before we can plug it in. And finally, plug in the x value that you just calculated. So let's go through this process together so you can see what this is going to look like. Step number one is find the derivative of the original. Now this problem, the original is x to the fifth plus x plus one. So the derivative would be five x to the fourth plus one. Step number two, write one over the derivative. So one over five x to the fourth plus one. Step number three, calculate the y sorry, calculate the x well, that goes with this y. So if this is a y value of the original, we would write one equals x to the fifth plus x plus one. 
we would then subtract 1 on both sides and we would get 0 equals x to the fifth plus x. To solve this I would factor out an x and I would get x equals 0 is my only solution because this guy right here will never equal 0 since it's a positive number it's x to the fourth plus 1. Last but not least I'm going to take the zero that I just calculated and plug it in here. So the derivative of the inverse at 1 is 1 over 5 times 0 to the 4th plus 1, which is 1 over 1, which is 1. Now let's try some sample problems so you can see the types of questions that you might get on a test or on the AP test. So let's start with number 1. Number 1 says f of x is x cubed minus 1. Find the derivative of the inverse at 7. So step number 1 is going to be to take the derivative of the original. So the derivative of the original would be 3x squared. Step number 2 is going to be to put that derivative on the bottom. 1 over 3x squared. Step number three is going to be to calculate your x value. This is a y value of the original. So I would write 7 equals x cubed minus 1. I would add the 1, so 8 equals x cubed. And then I would cube root it, and I would get 2. Last but not least, take this number and plug it in here. So the inverse's derivative at 7 is 1 over 3 times 2 squared, which would be 1 over 12. Let's save number 2 in case we need to go over anything in class tomorrow, and let's skip to this next problem. So the next problem says we've given you a chart that shows you the values of the original function and the values of the derivative so for some particular numbers. Number 3 says find the derivative of the inverse at 1. Now even though we don't have an equation, we're going to follow this same four-step process. So first, take the derivative of the original. Well, if we're talking about the inverse of g, then the original was just g. So the derivative would just be g prime. Then, step number two is, put the derivative on the bottom. 1 over g prime. Step number three is, calculate your x. So if this is a y value of g of x, then we want to know when, so what x value, makes g of x equal to 1. Well, if I look in this chart here, the g of x row is right here. The y value is 1 when the x is negative 1. So x equals negative 1. Last but not least, plug this number into this equation. So 1 over g prime of negative 1. Now to find g prime of negative 1, I would go to that same table and find the negative 1 in the x row and then look for g prime, which means I would have 1 over negative 1 fifth, which is negative 5. Now let's try that again. So problem number four says find the derivative of the inverse of g at negative three. So step number one would be to take the derivative of the original. So g prime of the original, g. Step number two would be to put that on the bottom. One over g prime. Step number three would be to calculate your x value. So this number is a y value of the original g of x. So if I go to the row for g of x and I find the negative 3, the original x value would have been 4. So g of x equals negative 3 when x equals 4.
Last but not least, I would take this number and plug it in. So 1 over g prime of 4. If I go to the row where x is 4, g prime is negative 2. So I would have 1 over negative 2 as my answer. Even though we have a table of values, finding the derivatives process is still the same. Let's look at one more example. Number 5 says let f be a function defined by this guy and g is the inverse of f. If g of 2 equals 1, what is the value of g prime of 2? Let's start with the question. What is the value of g prime of 2? Now g is the inverse of f. So this is really asking me to find the derivative of the inverse of f, which means step one would just be to find the derivative of the original f, which is based on this equation, 3x squared plus one. Now same step two, which is to put that on the bottom, one over 3x squared plus one. Same step three, this is going to be a y value of the original function. So we want to know what x value would give me 2 as my y value. However, if I try to solve that in the original, it's kind of tricky. And if I try, I don't have a table to look at. So the trick for problems like this is that they usually tell you somewhere in the problem what number to use. Here they said g of 2 is 1. Since g is the inverse, this is the y value, which means the original x value must have been 1. Because remember, when it's the inverse, the x's and y's are switched. So even though this looks like a y, it's really an x. The last thing is we plug that in to here. So we would have 1 over 3 times 1 squared plus 1, which is 1 over 4. I will tell you that on the AP test, problems 3, 4, and 5 are really the types of problems that you're going to see. You're never really going to see problems like numbers 1 and 2, which is why it was more important for me to spend time in this video on 3, 4, and 5. Tomorrow in class, we're going to practice this a bunch of times to get used to this pattern of solving, and I will see you tomorrow. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great night.